Hi, this is Leah with Handwoven by Leah. Today I'm going to be talking about a, a beginner video series on quilting and a step-by-step -step process. So this makes the assumption that you have no quilting experience. I know there's a lot of videos out there um, that have similar things on it, but there's an assumption that you have some knowledge about quilting. But I'm going on the idea that you don't have any knowledge. So if that's you, um, please enjoy this video. It'll be the first one in probably eight or nine different videos that I'm going to make on quilting for the beginner. The first thing that I'm going to talk about is the sewing machine. Every machine is different. And so I can't give you a lot of information on sewing machines just because whatever you buy, you really need to go through your owner's manual, learn how to thread the machine, learn how to thread your bobbin, find out what all the pieces to your machine are, the tension knob, um, the tension knob for your upper thread, the tension knob or the tension for your uh, bobbin thread, so usually on the machine itself, you're going to have a knob that you can change the thread that you've threaded the machine with. Um, but with the bobbins, and every bobbin case is different. So this is just an example of one. Most of them are going to look different. And um, I have another machine that I can pull one out of. But this is for one of my machines. See that? I don't know if you can see it or not. It looks blurry to me, but there's a screw. There's a screw right there. So that, if I turn that screw, it's going to tighten or loosen, depending on which way I go, the tension on my bobbin thread. So you should be able to take the string of your bobbin and it not go zooming down to the floor. So mine's held right there. And that's what you want. But you don't want it so tight that it doesn't easily pull either. So that's your how you fix the bobbin tension. Um, now let me get from my other machine. Oh, actually I can't get it out without taking the face plate off. Um, Well, let me just, I'll pause for a second and do that. Just a minute. Okay, I'm back. So this is what a lot of bobbin cases will look like. And right there is a screw. If you turn that screw one way or the other, it's going to tighten or loosen the bobbin case. With this bobbin case, you can't test it like I just showed you on the other bobbin case by holding the thread up and making sure it doesn't drop to the floor. So the only way to test this one is to put the machine back together and sew and see how it goes if you know how it, how it goes on. Um, it's kind of a pain having to take the plate off but you need to be taking that plate off after every project to clean it anyway. So there's usually just two screws that you have to take out. They usually give you a tool um, to take those screws out that look something like this. But I find these hard to hang on to. So what I did is I went on to Amazon and I bought this little screwdriver because the taller screwdrivers you can't get in the right place because they bump into the machine. You can't turn them. So this is a little one that fits both of my machines. So it would fit probably most any machine. Um, and it makes it so much easier to get the screws out. So um, one thing that you'll notice with your tension is that if the bobbin thread, when you sew, if the bobbin thread, and you need to use a different color of bobbin thread in order for this um, to 
in order for you to see. So say you put a dark blue in the bobbin and a white on the top where you thread your machine. Get some scrap fabric and sew. If you see the dark blue thread on the top of your fabric, you have a tension issue. You should never see your bobbin thread come through to the top of the fabric. Most likely it's going to be the knob that's on your machine that controls the threading of your machine. So loosen that quite a bit. Sew some more. See if you're still seeing the blue. If you are, loosen it some more. See if you're still seeing the blue after you sew. If you are, loosen it as far as you can loosen it. If you're still seeing the thread, then you need to go to your bobbin thread and either tighten it or loosen it. I've never had to go to the bobbin thread, so I can't tell you whether it needs to be tightened or loosened. Um, I'm just not sure because I've never had to go that route. Usually it's, it's always worked for me just adjusting the tension on the, uh, the knob on the front of the machine. So once you get that set, then just remember where it's set because occasionally you may have to change your tension. Not often, but occasionally you might have to. Um, it just depends on what you're sewing. But if you're just doing quilting, you probably never will have to touch your tension once you get it set right. Um, all right, so what else? For what kind of machine do you need? You don't need a fancy machine for quilting. It all depends on what you want to do. If you want to make like bags or clothing or different items like that, um, you may want a machine that has, or you're going to want a machine, especially for clothing, that has different stitches like zigzag or decorative stitches. But if you just want to do quilting, all you need is straight stitch. You don't need any of those other stitches. You can use them if you want. Sometimes when people bind their quilt, they'll use a decorative stitch. I don't do that. I usually make all of my quilts on my straight stitch only machine. Um, I just don't see a need for putting decorative stitches on a quilt, but people do. Um, so it's all up to what kind of quilt you want to make, what your objective is. But if you wanted to just do quilting, you could buy just a straight stitch machine. Actually, that's my favorite machine. I have a um, Juki TL2000QI, and I absolutely love it. It's really heavy, so it's not something that you want to carry around to retreats and things like that. But it has a huge throat space, and it's just an excellent machine. And it wasn't all that expensive either. And Juki is a really good brand. Um, what else? Let's see. Oh, the um, feet for the machine. So you'll have, you need a couple of feet. This is always handy. This is a one fourth inch foot. Your machine won't come with it, so you'll have to buy it separately. But it's a one fourth inch. So when you sew, you know that you're getting exactly a one fourth inch seam allowance, which is what we normally use on, in quilting. The other thing that you may run across in quilting is a scant one fourth inch, which is like one or two hairs or one or two threads um, less than an actual fourth of an inch. My machine actually has a scant foot. And I know you can't really tell size on here, so it's not gonna really make a big difference to you, but this is a regular foot which is my one fourth inch foot, and this is scant. So if I put them together, see if I can show you this. I don't know if you can see that or not, but it's just a little bit, tiny little bit. See that? That makes a scant. What you can do, most of the time you can't buy a scant foot. I got lucky with my machine and you can. Um, 
there's ways around that though. You can use your regular, the regular foot on your machine, and then you can use one of these gadgets, which is magnetic, and you'll measure. I have this tool. So it has different markings on it of where, of what, like if you put your needle in one of these holes here, it goes one eighth, one fourth, three eighths, one half. So say I want a half an of, of an inch seam allowance. I would put this down on my machine and gently turn the knobs until my needle goes down in that hole. Don't run it, like put your foot on the gas because you might not be exactly over the hole and then you'll break your needle. So just gently turn your knob until and adjust this until you're in the hole. Once you're in that hole, then you can take this and put it right up against the side of this tool here and it'll stick to your machine. If your machine is, has any metal pieces to it, it'll stick to your machine and then you'll pull your needle back up by turning the knob and take this away. This is now where you're going to, what you're going to sew against. So the raw edge of your fabric is going to go against here and that's going to be your guide to know that you're at one fourth inch or a scant fourth inch. Um, so these two things are helpful. You don't have to have this. You can use masking tape. So you could use something like this and then put a piece of masking tape down the side on your machine and then remove this and then your guides the masking tape. You don't even have to have one of these. You can take a piece of paper measure however far I, found this on the web. I don't know why my phone just did that um so say you want a fourth of an inch take a piece of paper measure over a fourth of an inch make a dot come to your sewing machine put your needle through the middle of that dot that you just made make sure the paper's straight and then put your masking tape down. So you can do it without purchasing any additional items. It just, these kind of things make it easy and they aren't expensive. The other feet, oh, this is another type of one fourth inch foot. See how it has this guide here? So you sew next to that guide when you're sewing and that's a fourth inch. And then I do make things like um, makeup bags that I have to put a zipper in. So for my machine, this is a zipper foot. Most zipper foots look different than this though, but this is just a thin foot so that I can sew next to a zipper. And then you'll have your quilting feet. So the most the typical one looks like this. So you take your other foot off and you'll take the bracket that holds your foot off. There'll be a screw on your machine that you take it off with. Put the screw through here onto your machine and then the needle goes through the center of this. At that point then you would drop your feed dogs. Your feed dogs are the um, things that make that pull the fabric forward in your machine as you're sewing and when you're doing free motion quilting where you just want to be able to move your fabric around say that you're doing meandering I have this meandering template and when I use this I put my feed dogs down and then this foot goes in here and as you, you move your fabric, you don't move this, this hold, you hold this down tight, but this, you move your fabric and this comes around like this, and then you get a meandering design on your quilt. Um, the other, this is the one that I usually use. It's just a clunkier, bigger thing, but with this, I can turn this knob up here 
and get this foot to lay closer to the machine or further away from the machine so that say my hand is the fabric sometimes this is pushing down too hard and I can't move my fabric I need to be able to freely move my fabric and so I can turn this knob and bring this up off the fabric a little bit until I can freely move my fabric you don't want it all the way you want it touching the fabric you don't want it um, completely off your fabric and it can have a little bit of pressure on it just not a lot because then you can't move the fabric and then you can't do anything if you use a walking foot and just do straight lines on quilting you don't need um, to put the free motion quilt on and you don't need to drop your feed dogs this is called a walking foot and this helps pull the fabric because it's thicker once you're you have your quilt put together and you're ready to quilt it it's going to be rather thick and just putting it in your machine with a regular foot you're going to struggle to get it to move so they have this walking foot that helps guide pull the fabric through your machine as you're sewing so that works great there's also um uh, this one doesn't have it i guess a lot of them have a hole in the side here and a guide i don't ever use it because i find it difficult unless you're really good and you can sew your um uh, blocks together really straight in a straight row then I find that you can be off with that um, I wish I had it to show you I don't have it handy but it's just a piece of metal that like if you've already sewn one line then it you can use that guide and put it on top of the line and that's your guide to keep going straight I'm not that good to have that straight of a line and so then it gets your lines get off and so if I'm using my walking foot, I'm usually doing stitch in the ditch, which means once you have your um, quilt together, you've you sewn your blocks together, the um, where you sewed the two together, you sew right on top of that. That's called stitching in the ditch. And so that's what I would usually use my walking foot for. But with practice, you can get really good and use your walking foot and use that other extension of it and, and go in straight lines and not have to follow the seams that you've already sewn. One other thing that I want to mention real quickly is a seam ripper. So that's one of the things you need to have is a seam ripper. And a regular seam ripper looks like this this takes a while if you have to rip something out say something you sewed something together wrong and you need to do it again you can use this and rip out the stitches that's fine but I found this tool that makes it so fast and easy it's ridiculous so it's called the quick ripper it's like a mustache trimmer actually some people actually use their husband's mustache trimmers but um, basically what I do is I get the first couple of stitches out with this because it's when you've gone um, when you tie off on a machine when you're sewing you go you're going forward and then you hit the back button and so your machine starts going backwards and then you let go and it comes forward again so you have like three uh, things of thread at the beginning and the end of where you've sewn that ties it off so it, the sewing doesn't come apart. I find it hard to get through that with this. So I start with my regular seam ripper, do a couple of stitches, just enough to get it started and get the pieces pulled apart because I need to hold on to the top and the bottom to use this. You can um, pin it onto like your ironing board or something. So you pin, put a pin through the, the bottom layer of fabric and then you hold the top layer of your fabric and then you just use this and you just go right along and it cuts out all those stitches and you're done in like 
30 seconds, whereas using this might take you 10 minutes to get something completely ripped out without making a hole in your fabric and things like that. So you need one of these for sure, but it's nice if you have one of these. I think it cost me 20, 23 dollars, something like that. So it wasn't expensive and um, you can get it online at Amazon. All right. Um, needles. You need extra needles for your machine. You're gonna, for, for quilting, I use cotton fabric. You can use whatever fabric that you want, but if you're gonna use a fabric that stretches, that has any stretch in it, you're gonna have to interface the back of it. So you're gonna have to put the stuff called the interfacing on it. It irons to the fabric so that it makes your fabric um, more stiff and not able to um, expand or stretch. I never do that. Some people make t-shirt quilts. You've got to do it for the back of a t-shirt because a t-shirt stretches. So you have to put interfacing on it. So for me, I'm only using cotton fabrics. So the needle that you want to use for cotton fabric is called a 90-14. 90, that number, the first number, is the European number. And 14, the second number, is the U.S. number. They have uh, 1280, 1490, 3100, all different kinds of needles. I just stick with the 9014 for my quilting and I never have a problem. You can buy, um, I would buy some decent needles. So this is a good, good brand of needle. Again, these weren't expensive. I got like a hundred of them for, I don't know, maybe $10. I can't remember for sure. But, um, because you really need to change a needle. A needle gets dull after a while. So after every project, you should change your needle. Once in a while, you're going to break your needle. So you need to have extras on hand for when you break your needle. If you break your needle, something's gone wrong, though. You've, you've hit something. Um, and so you'll have to sort that out before continuing to sew. The needles have a flat edge on them. So you need to... When you take the needle out of your machine, especially the first time you're doing it, you need to really watch which side, when you pull the needle down, you, you um, loosen the screw, pull the needle down. Before you move it away from your machine though, or before you turn it, make sure you know where that flat side is. Is it facing to the back of the machine, to the inside of the machine, to the front of the machine, to the outside of the machine? Because that's how you're gonna know which way to put the needle back in when you put a new needle in. And you can mess around forever if you don't know which way that needle goes in before you find the right way to get it to actually go up into the machine. So just pay attention to that. Um, the next thing that I wanted to talk about is thread. Well, let's go back to needles for a minute. The larger the needle number the larger the needle is. So a 16 needle is going to be bigger than a 14 needle. When you talk about threads, the larger the number, the smaller your thread. So it's just the opposite. So when we're talking about threads, they have 30 weight, 40 weight, 50 weight, and other weights. I usually use 40 or 50 weight for quilting. Um, typically, I think I'm on the 50 weight. So, a 100 weight thread is going to be really, really thin. A 20 weight thread is going to be really thick. So say that you wanted to sew the hem on a jean. That takes a thicker thread, so you're going to want to be down in the 10 or 20 range number 
to get a thick enough thread for that to look like the rest of your stitches in the jeans. But for quilting, we want something along in the middle. So I go with the um, 50 weight thread. And it's not thick at all. It's, um, and I use all cotton. I recommend all cotton. You don't have to, but I've had so many problems with other, with thread that I just stick with the all cotton thread. Um, I don't like polyester because sometimes I make bowl cozies or plate cozies which go in the microwave. If I use polyester thread on that, it can't go in the microwave. And I don't want to have to be going through my stash of thread and trying to figure out which is cotton, which is polyester, what I can use, what I can't use. So I always just buy cotton. My machine likes cotton. You'll find that your machine prefers something over the other generally. My machine doesn't like cheap thread, unfortunately, so I have to buy the more expensive thread. But anyway, this is 50 weight. Oh, you can't really see that. This is 50 weight thread. Um, so it, it's, you know, it's right, it's thin, what you would typically expect sewing thread to look like. Um, what else? Oh, oiling your machine. Some machines need to be oiled, some don't. You need to look at your manual to find out if your machine needs to be oiled. If it does need to be oiled, you need to oil it as recommended by your manual. Like mine says that I need to oil my machine after every four to six hours of sewing. And if you don't, your machine will die on you. So if you have a machine that has to be oiled, you need to do that. I have one machine that needs to be oiled. My other machine doesn't need to be oiled. So read your manual to find out which way you are. The other thing, when you take your faceplate off, um, let me see if I can show you what I'm talking about as a faceplate. Okay, so this is the faceplate of my machine. I have to unscrew these two screws and take it off and then clean out because when you're... Okay, my video went sideways on me, so I'm having to do this section over again. Basically what I was saying is that you need to clean out under your faceplate because you get um, lint and stuff in there. So after every project, go ahead and clean it out. I have these things that I bought from Juki Junk Junkies. Um, they're specifically for cleaning the machine. They just hang on to the lint and stuff better than like a Q-tip, but you can use a Q-tip. That works too. These just have a long handle. The one thing that you don't want to do is to use a can of spray air. That By spraying it, that can um, disperse those tiny particles of lint up into your machine and wreak havoc. So you never want to do that. Only clean out what you can see and don't use the spray that is going to push it where you can't see it and push it up into the tiny crevices of your machine. Um, I think that was all that was at the end of this um, video. The video will continue as video 1.2. Initially my video was way too long so I had to cut it down. Um, so have, be on a lookout for video 1.2 to finish this first video off and then we'll move into other things that shouldn't be as long as this initial video. Again thank you for watching and have a great day.